We are live. Hey, how is it going? Lee Hayward here with the Total Fitness Bodybuilding video chat for Friday, July 22nd. So hopefully this is coming through loud and clear and you can hear me and you can see me and all that good stuff. I'm uh, back up in my office for the last several video chats. I've been down in the basement in the home gym doing these video chats, but today I'm up in my office doing them. So a little different background. It's warm up here. <laughs> That's why I've been normally doing the video chats down in my basement at home gym. But today, doing them up here. So let's see. Who do we have joining in? As you log in today for our video chat, let me know. Just type into the chat window there. Let me know who you are and where you're joining in from. We've got Dan. I, th I think, Dan, I got to give you uh, credit for being uh, one of the first people to always chime in to these video chats, right? He always is one of the... The early birds, all right? I respect the consistency and I respect your support. Thank you so much. I'm assuming this is coming through loud and clear. If it is coming through loud and clear, just let me know, right? Type loud and clear there in the video chat. I'm assuming it is, but I always like to double check because I have had a few instances where I, I just, I forgot to do my little audio video check and then I start rambling on, you know, starting off the chat, if you will. And then lo and behold, the microphone is not working or something's whatever, right? You know, something's not connected properly. And the next thing you know, I'm five minutes into a chat and then I realize people are saying, hey, we can't hear a word you're saying, dude. You're just a <laughs> just a moving mouth and no sound. All right. So the way these video chats work is I'm going to be hanging out here for the next little while, answering any questions that you may have related to fitness and nutrition anything regarding building muscle, losing fat, and getting in your best shape, feel free to type those questions or topics of discussion into our chat window, and I'll do the best that I can to help you out over the course of our chat today. So that's how these work. And I know we have a lot of regulars tuning in, but if you're new to these video chats, let me know. If you're brand new, you get you get special priority if you're brand new to these video chats. I like to prioritize new people because it's always nice to have new people joining in. So if you are new, let me know and type your question there and you'll get top priority. Now, over the course of our chat today, there's a few things that I wanted to address. And these are some questions and conversations that I've been having with people over the past week. And some common things that a lot of people have been addressing to me. And, and that's one of the things I give you my permission to do. Like if, if during these video chats, if there's anything that I, I either didn't cover during the video chat or you need some extra help, feel free to reach out to me. And of course, you can email me at leeh at leehayward.com. That's my personal email. Or you can friend me up over on Facebook. Um, just search for Lee Hayward on Facebook. And you'll see a picture of me, my profile image, doing a bicep pose, right? <laughs> you know, should should be the, I'm probably the only Lee Hayward with the front double bicep pose as my profile picture. Even though if you search Lee Hayward on Facebook, there's a lot of Lee Haywards. Just like I'm sure if you search your own name on Facebook, there's probably a lot of people with your name as well. But um, you see my profile picture, and I actually have the name. So it's facebook.com forward slash Lee.Hayward. So that's my Facebook profile if you want to friend me up over there, and we can have a chat that way. And I, I like Facebook. Facebook's actually one of my preferred platforms because of that two-way conversation, right? I mean, I love YouTube for the videos and everything else. But except in situations like this and, you know, through the comments, it's really a one-way conversation, whereas Facebook is more of a back-and-forth conversation, and I like to have that, to have that connection with people, right? Because then you can really dive in deep and get to know somebody better versus just making a, a one-sided video, if you will. So there we go. That's how these video chats work, and I'm going to be addressing some questions and topics of discussion there. So we have some coming through already. Good stuff. So we got Dan joining in. We got Lee joining in. Robert is joining us. John is joining us. Ange is joining us. Good stuff. Good stuff. All right. Um, so one of the things I want to, I'm just going to like say so stretch a little bit, give people time to type in their questions there. But one of the things that I wanted to address was a topic that came through uh, earlier this week, and it was about progress. And I believe it was Andrew was, we were having a Facebook messenger conversation about this. And he was sharing some of his uh, progress that he's made over the past several months. You know, he's really been prioritizing 
a muscle building program and he's added some size to his frame. He's increased his lifts and all these major exercises. And he listed out all the numbers, you know, and then he was asking me, is that good enough? Like, is it enough to be proud of, if you will? And should he be happy with his progress? And I really want you to reframe this. All progress is good progress. It really is. Like a lot of times we we get into a competition or something almost like thinking, well, oh, I didn't make as good a progress as somebody else or, you know, whatever. And, and, and you almost don't feel good about the progress you made. You're almost beating yourself up thinking, oh, I should have done better. Whereas that's not the way to succeed in this. Like celebrate every victory. Celebrate the small wins because all those small wins are going to compound to the big wins. So if you're trying to gain muscle, if you increase your strength in a certain exercise, celebrate that. I mean, if you get an extra five pounds on a lift, you get an extra rep on a set, you know, you, whatever. You see some form of progress, even if it's baby progress, celebrate it, feel good about it and, and learn to enjoy that progress because those little bits of progress are going to compound to the bigger progress. Vice versa, if your goal is fat loss. I mean, if you drop a pound on the scale, celebrate it. If you can tighten up your belt another notch, celebrate it. Like if you can see some visible muscle definition that wasn't there before, or you know, you, you got a vein in your arm that wasn't there before, or any bit of progress whatsoever, somebody gives you a compliment, celebrate it. Feel good about the little bits of progress because all those little bits of progress are going to compound to the bigger progress. And the biggest mistake I've seen a lot of people make is they beat themselves up over slow progress. So let's just say like you're trying to, to follow a fat loss program. I, I, I tend to talk more about fat loss because the average person is overweight and out of shape. If you haven't realized that, like go out in public, like go to your local grocery store, go to the mall, go anywhere out in public and just look around. At least in, in most places, like on average, people are overweight and out of shape. So I tend to focus primarily on fat loss because that's what people reach out to me for mostly is, is usually losing body fat while building lean muscle. Now, sometimes we have the other extreme where someone's too skinny and they want to fill out their frame. But bottom line, I mean, there's, there's a lot of there's a lot of crossover. There's the same core principles apply in both situations. I mean, you want to eat better. You want to exercise and adopt healthier lifestyle habits. It's just we're going to manipulate the variables depending on what it is you're trying to achieve. But anyway, back to my story here. <laughs> If, if you are following a fat loss program and your goal is to lose body fat, and let's just say you, you drop five pounds over the course of several weeks, I've actually seen people get discouraged and beat themselves up saying like, oh man, I've been dieting for a whole month and I only lost five pounds. What's the point? And, and they, they get upset over it. Whereas like they should be celebrating it because if you're beating yourself up over slow progress, thinking, oh, it's not good enough and I'm not doing, I'm not losing it fast enough and all oh, this is going to take too long and poor me, blah, blah, blah. If you beat yourself up over slow progress, you're, go you're not going to want to have slow progress. And then slow progress is the way progress works. All progress is slow progress. It's just slow progress compounds over time to long-term substantial progress. So nobody goes from like zero to hero overnight. Like nobody is like obese, uh, one week and then next week they're ripped in six pack abs. Like it doesn't happen that way. It's slow progress that compounds over weeks and months and sometimes even years. It's not something that's just going to happen overnight. So whenever you make any progress, celebrate it, give yourself permission to feel good about it because then you're going to want to have more slow progress, right? More little baby steps, more baby steps in the right direction. And the more you can move forward and the more you enjoy it and the more you feel good about it, the more you're going to want to do it. All right. So don't get caught up in this whole, oh, I'm, I'm not making progress fast enough or I'm not good enough type of mentality because that's just a, you're setting yourself up for disappointment and failure, right? I've, I've actually seen people quit when they're making progress because they feel it's not good enough. And just give you a heads up, there's always going to be somebody who's bigger, stronger, faster, leaner, whatever. So like, don't go comparing yourself to somebody else. Compare yourself to who you were before. And the goal is to be better than you were before. And if you're doing that, you're better than you were before, you're a success, right? That's what you got to measure your progress by. All right, uh, let's see what else we got there. Some questions come through, lots of them coming through. So I'm just going to jump right into these here now. 
So we got uh, John's asking about hand grippers. He says, does it matter what shape they are if you get a different shape and you still use it? Um, it, it there are, there's a ton of different hand grippers out there, right? You go to any department store, sporting goods store, you're going to see a lot of different hand gripper models out there. My advice is to experiment and try them. See what feels best for you, right? If, if it feels good, you find it secure in your hand and you get a good grip on it, that's fine. I personally like the high quality steel handle grippers, like not the cheap plastic handle ones that you get at Walmart and different, you know, sporting goods stores. I like heavy grips, hand grippers, and I actually have one here. These are steel handle grippers, and they've got gnarling on them, same as like the, the grip on a barbell. You know, you can see it there on the camera. So it's got that rough edge, just the same as like a barbell in the gym or a dumbbell handle in the gym. So it's very secure. And when you're doing your gripper work, it doesn't slide in your hands. You get that solid grip. And these are built to last. I mean, these are very tough, durable. And this is what I prefer when it comes to hand gripper training. But with that being said, if you've got some other grippers, as long as they're comfortable, I mean, you, you can make it work. But these are the style of grippers that I would recommend. If you're looking to go out and buy some, don't get the cheap plastic handle ones. Get yourself a, a set of solid steel quality hand grippers. And it, it's like a one-time purchase because these things are going to last. Like I bought this in 2004 and it's still just as good as it is as it was back then right like they, they don't wear out you know i mean technically they could but like they're going to last a long time put it that way you buy quality it's going to last all right what else we got there um and just joining and he's saying is it bad to go to complete failure every single exercise every set I feel as if the exercises I don't take to failure seem to progress so much more, such as squats and deadlifts. Why is this? I've been lifting for a year. Is it normal to only add five pounds to a bench press each month? Um, okay. First off, you don't want to go to failure on every single exercise for every single set. Failure is something that should be used sparingly. Like you, you push the limits sometimes, occasionally. And, and even then I'm going to give you the true definition of failure. Failure is not what most people think it is. Like mo let's use the bench press as an example. Cause I know you mentioned that most people consider failure on the bench press is when you get to the point where the barbell is down across your chest, you're stapled to the bench, helpless and pinned and can't move. And you're like, oh, help, help, right? Spot, spot, <laughs> oh, right? And, and you're stuck. Like that's most people's definition of failure is when they get to the point where they can't move the weight at all, right? It's just like nothing. That's their definition of failure. That is beyond failure. True failure is the point at which you can't perform another repetition with good form by yourself without the help of a spotter. So when your form starts to break down, You've hit failure. When you can't do another proper repetition with good form, that's failure. So a lot of times when you're doing your exercises, once your form starts to break down, that's it. You've stimulated the muscle. Like rack the weight, end the set, live to lift another day. Don't push it to the extreme where you're stapled to the bench and, and struggling for your life. Because when you're at that level, the risk of injury is exponentially high and the potential reward is minuscule. <laughs> the risk to reward is not in your favor. You're more likely to, to tear a rotator cuff, tear a pec, just, just hurt yourself versus actually making muscle gains. And you can make progress without killing yourself in the gym. It's all about being good enough, but good enough consistently over the long term. And if you do too much too soon and you end up hurting yourself, then you can't be consistent anymore. Right. So you have to look at it from a bigger picture perspective and think of this as a lifestyle and a long term thing and not just trying to go in there and annihilate the muscle in a single workout. Right. Think of being good enough and good enough consistently over the long term. Right. I'll give you another analogy. I mean, just think of like like could you physically work 24 hours straight? 
like if you had to, like if let's just say your boss said, hey, we're working on a special project. We need to get stuff done. We got to pull an all nighter, guys. We got to work around the clock. Like, could you physically do it? Yeah, you may be able to do it occasionally, like once every blue moon or something like that. But could you do it day after day after day? Of course not. Nobody can. You physically can't work that hard. Like you need to rest. The same applies with your workouts. Like you can't go pedal to the metal, you know, to train to failure and beyond and expect to be able to recover and grow from that. Like it's, it's too much. It's overkill, right? You need to be able to rest, recover and grow. And you need to be able to pace yourself and, and like give yourself permission to, to stop before you annihilate the muscle. You only need to stimulate it. You don't need to annihilate it. So no, you don't need to go to failure every single exercise, every single set. And failure should be done. Like if you are training to failure, it should be on your like maybe one or two sets per exercise. And it should be true failure, meaning the point where your form breaks down, not the point where you can't lift the weight at all. So another example bicep curls when you get to the point where you can't do another strict curl you've hit failure now granted if you start swinging and heaving and using leg drive and everything else you'll probably be able to do some more curls but that's cheat curls that's beyond failure so once you get to the point where you can't do another strict curl you've hit failure right there's there's so many exercises like that same with rows like when you're doing a, a, a barbell row or anything any type of row once you get to the point where you can't do another strict form that's failure now, if you start heaving and jerking and leg driving and everything else, yeah, you'll probably be able to move more weight, but it's not quality, right? You're not providing adequate, you know, it's not good muscle stimulation. It's just simply using momentum and, and whatever else you can to simply move weight. And once you get into that, where you're resorting to momentum, uh, it, the risk of injury goes up expen exponentially. So you don't want to do that. You want to remain injury free. Uh, what else you got there? Is it normal to only add five pounds to a bench press a month? <laughs> I already addressed that earlier on. Any progress is good progress. I mean, just think of it. If, if, if you added five pounds to your bench press this month, like that is huge. What if you did that every month? Like over the course of the next year, you would add 60 pounds to your bench press, right? What if you did that for the next 10 years? Oh, you added 600 pounds to your bench press. Like it's, it's not going to continue at that rate. Like at this stage now where you're still in your first year of training, like five pounds seems like so small that like you're like, oh, I only added five pounds, big deal. But by the time someone's been training for 10 or 20 years, if they add five pounds to a lift, that's huge because the, the more experience you have, the harder it is to make further progress, right? Like you have the, the advantage of the, the quote unquote newbie gains at this stage of the game where things happen faster just from being consistent. But once you start to maximize your genetic potential and, you know, filling out your frame with muscle, the more muscle you gain, the harder it is to gain even more muscle on top of that and, and more strength. So for advanced lifters, I mean, if they add five pounds, they're celebrating like that. That's jumping up and down, high five and woohoo like that. That's that's cause for celebration. It's not cause for like, oh, I suck. I only added five pounds. Right. Like that's that's a you got to change your mentality to that and realize that every bit of progress is good progress. Don't beat yourself up over slow progress. Like I, I already mentioned that earlier, so I'm not going to re rehash myself here. All right. Uh, but da, 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 da. What else we got there? We got Henry joining in. Welcome Henry from Detroit. We've got J E joining us. Let's get more likes for Lee. Any opinion on the theory of nucleus overload training? Uh, no, I don't. <laughs> I, I I don't have any special comments or whatever when it comes to that. I mean, that's so no. I mean, I've I've heard of it, but it's I'd have to look into it myself because it's not a common term that I use with me and my coaching students. All right, so I'm going to have to appreciate the support and everything else, but I'm going to have to pass on that one for now. I don't have anything more to add at this stage. Uh, we got Lee Dunnigan joining in, says, I recently added the hip adductor machines, so hip adductor and abductor and adductor, ab and ad, so it's inner and outer thigh, basically. You know? uh, he says, I've been doing them at the end of each leg session. Is this a good thing to do? I've never really used them before. Yes, it is a good thing to do. Now, whether or not you do it after every leg workout, it's, you know, 
kind of optional, but it's something you should do regularly. And the thing with the inner and outer thigh machine, adductor and abductor, is it works muscles that you normally never train. So like most people never work their hips or their inner thighs. They're always just focusing on squats, leg presses, leg extensions, leg curls, lunges, like that, the movements and that's like that, that plane of motion. They're not in the opening and closing plane of motion. So when you start to strengthen the hips and the, the inner thighs, this adds another dimension to your leg training and it helps to stabilize them even more. And this is especially important for anybody who's involved with athletics where you have to do like maybe like a, a court sport or side to side movement or something like that, because you want to have strong hips and adductors and stuff like that so that you can move laterally. Uh, but it'll also help to increase stabilization for squats, deadlifts, you know, like uh, all types of exercises like that. And the hips are a weak link for a lot of people. Very like most people are surprised with how weak their hips really are because again, they never train it. You know, it's kind of like out of sight, out of mind type of thing. They've never ever focused on it. So they don't realize just how weak the hips are. But once you start strengthening those weak links, you know, it's it just strengthens the chain all over, right? I mean, the chain is only as strong as its weakest link. So you might have crazy strong quads, crazy strong hamstrings, crazy strong calves. But if you got weak hips, well, that's the weak link in your chain. So you want to make sure that all those areas are strong. And I personally use those machines on a regular basis because I do want to have the, the, the strength and the mobility throughout the hips. And I find that it makes a big difference, not just for, you know, the, the overall strength, but also for injury prevention as well. Uh, we've got William joining in. I think it's William. He got a big old long name. I, my, the first name is William. So that's what I'm going to call you. <laughs> Uh, says, Lee, you're looking good. I'm a shy person, quiet guy who can't really hold a conversation. I'm already 28 years old and scared how I will end up. Thoughts on bodybuilding would help, but thought bodybuilding would help, but it didn't. Any advice? I respect you for reaching out and sharing that. You know, it, it takes, even though I know you got a fake username and profile picture and all that there, you know, it, it takes balls to put yourself out there and and to acknowledge that. So uh, kudos to you for that. I can totally relate to where you're coming from because I am naturally a very shy, introverted person. And how I got out of my shell, so to speak, well, one was bodybuilding. That's This is actually quite common, right? And this is kind of a, a different topic we don't really dive into a lot. But very often, some of the most successful bodybuilders and athletes that you're going to meet are very shy, self-conscious people. And the reason they succeed in bodybuilding or athletics or whatever is because they're using that as an outlet. Like, hey, I, I don't I don't have a lot of self-confidence in me or my communication skills or, or personality skills or whatever. But by God darn it, I'm going to build my body. And I'm going to build this, this, this shell of muscle as, as like a suit of armor, if you will. And that's going to build up my confidence. And you'd be surprised at how many bodybuilders, even though they look like a brick shit house, right? You know, like they're they're built like a tank and strong and everything else. Underneath, a lot of them are very shy and self conscious people, right? It's 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 so common. And if you had to put them on the spot, like put them on stage and give them a microphone in front of an auditorium of people, it's bad, 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 bad. <laughs> like they'd be, you know, shell shocked, right? And it's it's just it, it's so common. So I, I can relate to that because I was in a similar situation. That's why I got involved with, with bodybuilding. That's why I got involved with martial arts, all those things. Because when I was in school, like I was the shy kid, the quiet kid. I used to get picked on by the bullies because they could sense that I was weak. And they used to bully me and kick the shit out of me at school. And I said, you know, I, I got to do something to take care of myself. So I started off with martial arts. And then through martial arts, I got into weight training. And then that led into bodybuilding and competition. And then that just... just kind of flourished and I really enjoyed it. I enjoyed the confidence that it gave me. I enjoyed the respect that it gave me because especially as a kid going through school, if you're bigger and stronger than your peers, you get respect just from that alone. I mean, even as an adult, you, you do get more respect as well. Like if you're in better shape and you take care of yourself physically, people tend to respect that. But that was one of the things that really led me to bodybuilding is why I became so obsessed with it is because I was so shy and self-conscious. But how I started to develop my conversation and communication skills 
was a, a club called Toastmasters, Toastmasters International. And if you're not familiar with this, I want you to Google search Toastmasters International. And it's a, it is an international organization and it's all about improving your communication and public speaking skills. And I did Toastmasters from 2008, right up until the pandemic, when they actually had to stop doing the the live in-person meetings and they switched to doing Zoom meetings and all that. But it, it wasn't the same person, you know, it's not the same experience when you're doing a Zoom meeting versus the live in-person meetings. So when they switched to that, I kind of, you know, lost interest in it, so to speak. And and I haven't been back since, but if they start back, I, I guess they are. I, I really don't know. I haven't looked into our local club lately, but I really took to Toastmasters and it was a game changer. It was one of the best decisions I've ever made. And the thing about Toastmasters is it's a relatively small supportive group. So when I say small, like an average meeting is probably about 20 people. Like some clubs, maybe a little more, some clubs, maybe a little less, but you're looking at a ballpark of around 20 people. And it's, we, we did it at our local university. So we had like a, a little conference room. So it was like a, a, you know, a conference room, round table situation. And it's a structured meeting where people practice public speaking. And there's there's different roles within the meeting itself. So like, for example, there'd be a chairperson who's going to run and organize the meeting. And then they'd be calling on different people to do various roles. Uh, some people will be doing prepared speeches and, you know, where they get up and give a speech to the group. And then you have other people who are evaluators who will get up and then do an evaluation, you know, offering some uh, feedback and constructive criticism on the speech. And then at the uh, end, then they have like a competition where like, hey, who was the best speaker of the night? Who was the best evaluator of the night? And they even have some impromptu speaking. And this is one thing that I love. It's called table topics where everybody around the table, you, you get you get a topic, just a random topic out of the blue. And you had to speak on it off the cuff for one minute. And then at the end of the meeting, everyone votes like who did the best table topics. But it, it's a fun group. Like it's it's a fun experience and it pushes you outside your comfort zone. But you're doing so in a safe and supportive environment. And the idea is, is just repetition. The more you do it, the better you get. And this is what really helped me to get outside my shell and develop my communication skills. And this is where I launched my whole YouTube channel was because of Toastmasters. Because before Toastmasters, I was too shy and self-conscious to get on a video and talk. I was too shy and self-conscious to get on a teleseminar or anything else because I was too, too insecure. But through years of Toastmasters, like that's what helped me to come out of my shell. And very often, like even some of the topics that I would make videos on, I would go and practice and give those as prepared speeches at the Toastmasters Club. So like I would talk about fitness and nutrition and I would talk about bodybuilding and different things like that. And it was like a, a, tri a trial, like a trial run, if you will, before actually making a YouTube video on it. So that made a huge difference. And I did it, again, from 2008 up until 2020, you know, when everything started to, you know, the, the shit hit the fan, if you will, and the world shut down due to the pandemic. So for basically 12 years, I was a member of Toastmasters and I worked my way up through the ranks. Like for a while I was our club president and I had various roles within the club. I mean, it, it really made a huge difference. And I competed at various uh, you know, speech contests that we had, even won several of them. And the cool thing about Toastmasters is it's an international group. So if you're traveling, you can go to other Toastmaster clubs. Like you just go to their website, toastmasters.org. And you can search. So let's just say I'm, I'm traveling to New York City. And I say, you know what? While I'm in New York, I want to join in on a Toastmasters club. And I can search for Toastmasters clubs in New York. And I'll get a whole list of all the clubs, you know, who to contact and everything else. And then I can reach out to their, you know, uh, club executive and say, hey, I'm going to be in town from this date to that date. Like, do you have any meetings or whatever? What's your schedule? Blah, blah, blah. And I can literally meet up with these people. And it's like they're going to welcome you with open arms. So, I mean, like it's a great way to make friends. And even if you're traveling, I mean, it's a great way to connect and meet friends in different cities. And I've done the same. Like people have come to Newfoundland and joined in our Toastmasters clubs. And, you know, I got to make some friends from different parts of the world that way. So it's really cool. But it's everyone's there with that common support to help support and encourage one another to improve your communication skills. And again, it's, it's been a game changer for me, right? I can't say enough good things about it. So that's how I came out of my shell and 
everything that we have here on YouTube now today, I mean, that all stemmed from Toastmasters. If it wasn't for Toastmasters, I'd probably be still too shy to get on camera and talk. <laughs> so there, that's the, that, that's, that's the million dollar advice that I can give you right there. All right, moving on. That was a big, a big answer to a question. Hopefully it was helpful. Uh, we got Chris joining in. Can you build muscular legs with just dumbbell exercises or are barbell squats necessary? Anything is better than nothing. I mean, if you're just starting out, you can build legs with body weight, with dumbbell. Uh, ideally, it'd be nice if you trained at a gym so you have access to a full spectrum of machines because the legs, th there's a lot of different machine exercises that you can do for legs. And it's hard to really maximize leg training without access to proper gym equipment. Now, don't get me wrong. You still can. Like, you can do squats and you can do lunges and you can do... Uh, step ups and calf raises and a whole bunch of stuff like you can still get a great workout but when you open up the door to all the different machines that are available at the gym you really take things to the next level right it's almost like saying hey i, I want to write a book uh, but i'm only going to use a pen and paper can i still write a book sure you can you can still write a book with only a pen and paper but it makes it a hell of a lot easier if you got a computer with access to the internet and all this kind of stuff and you know word processing software i mean just think of the advantage someone has who's writing a book with a modern computer and the internet and all the technology and processing software versus someone who's got a pen and paper like you can still get the job done don't get me wrong but you're at a severe disadvantage, right? Same thing when it comes to trying to build your body with just a set of dumbbells, right? And yes, you can still get the job done, but compared to someone who has all the tools available, you're at a big disadvantage, right? So take advantage of what you have available. And these days, I mean, un unless you're living in some crazy remote part of the world where you're out in the sticks, most places have gyms available, right? Or at least you should be able to access gym equipment to somehow like maybe you can get a home gym or something like that but take advantage of, of, of the gym equipment like especially if you live in a city or, or a big town where there's a public gym available it, it's it's the single best thing that you can do to invest in your health and fitness all right we have neil joining in says good morning so obviously you're from australia or somewhere over in that neck of the woods uh, says, good to see you. We got the OG backdrop, <laughs> my office. Yeah. Uh, anyway, what's your routine on your off days? I, I don't really have quote unquote off days. Um, cause what I try to do is I try to alternate weight training one day and cardio the next. So every single day I try to do some form of exercise whether it's just getting outside for a walk, whether it's going for a bicycle ride, whether it's going to the gym and doing a full-on weight training workout. Sometimes it's just doing some body weight exercises at home. Sometimes it's doing like a, a yoga workout at home. But every day I try and get some form of exercise. Something's better than nothing. I always try. I, I, I want to do that for, for a couple reasons. One is because it makes me feel good, right? I've, I've kind of adapted myself to the point where I, I crave exercise. And on the days that I don't exercise, I don't feel right. It's almost like the days, you know, you don't get a shower. Like I feel dirty, right? I just like, oh, I, I, I crave a shower. I, I, like if you, if you go a day or two without getting a shower, it's like, man, I feel like a pig. I want to get a shower. I, I actually crave it. So if I go a day or two without exercise, I'm like, man, I, I'm craving this. I need this, right? So I actually, I want to have it on a regular basis. So I try to exercise every day, but I will vary the intensity. So if I'm feeling strong, I'm fully recovered, that's the day I'm going to push it hard. Maybe it's going to be a hard weight training workout at the gym. Maybe it's going to be a hard bicycle ride or whatever, but that's going to be the high intensity days is when I'm feeling good, fresh and recovered. When I'm feeling a bit tired, like maybe I just did one of those high intensity days the day before and the next day I'm feeling a bit fatigued. That's when I'm going to do some active recovery stuff. Maybe it's just going to be an easy get outside and go for a walk. Or maybe it's just going to be some stretching and mobility work and maybe some yoga at home. Uh, but I always try to get some form of exercise every day. That's one of my habits. Now, I'll be honest, there are some days it doesn't happen. But I would say probably 28 days out of a month, I'm exercising. 
right? It's very rare if I don't, but there are every, like every now and then something will happen, whether I'm either feeling sick or I'm just super busy or traveling or whatever, where I don't get in a, a structured exercise session, but it's rare. It's rare, right? I, I'd say, you know, 98% of the time I'm getting that daily exercise in some way, some shape, some form. And again, it's sometimes really small. Like yesterday, my exercise was just going for a 35 minute walk. That's what I did, right? I mean, it wasn't too intense or crazy, but it was still, it was something. It was just getting outside for a walk. Now today, it, it was more intense. I actually went for a 100 kilometer bicycle ride this morning, right? So it, it all depends, right? But I always try to get something every day. Okay, what else we got there? I feel like all my muscles are getting bigger, but not, sorry, this is from Ann. She says, I feel like all of my muscles are getting bigger, but not all are getting stronger. Can someone get bigger without getting stronger? All right. Yes. And, and I'm going to unpack that. It depends on what you mean by getting stronger, because certain exercises, you're not going to see strength gains in the same as others. And I'll give you a prime example. Think of isolation exercises versus compound exercises. Like adding five pounds to a 200 pound deadlift is a lot different than adding five pounds to a 20 pound dumbbell curl. Percentage wise, it's huge, right? Like five pounds to a 200 pound deadlift, like that's a, a relatively small jump in weight. Five pounds to a 20 pound dumbbell curl, that's a huge jump in weight. So you're looking at it, oh, well, I'm not making any gains in those dumbbell curls, but percentage wise, you probably are. It's just, it's not showing the same as it is with the bigger compound lifts. So you got to factor that in. The bigger the exercise, the, f the faster you're going to see strength gains in it because percentage-wise, it's, it's a smaller increment. And most gyms, the smallest weight that you can increase is five pounds. Now, I, I'm speaking in North America. I'm not sure what it's like international because I, don't, I haven't, have never been outside North America, honestly, so I don't know. But if you're training in an international gym with the weights are in kilograms, I don't know, maybe the smallest jump you can make is a one kilogram jump. I'm not sure. Right. But but still, it's you know, it, it's it's still it's a, you got to look at the percentage of the increase versus the uh, the exercise itself. So you're not going to make strength gains in your isolation exercises, but it doesn't mean that they're not working. And sometimes with your isolation exercises, you kind of got to once you get to a certain point, you're probably going to keep the same weights for a lot of them for a, a fairly long period of time. I mean, I'll, I'll use myself as an example. When it comes to like bicep curls with dumbbells, side lateral raises with dumbbells, um, you know, tricep kickbacks with dumbbells, like that kind of stuff, these smaller isolation exercises, I'm pretty much using the same weights. Like I'm not getting, I'm not going up by five pounds every workout or anything like that. I mean, it's, it's pretty much the weights are staying the same because again, it's so hard to make big jumps in weight with those small exercises and how I make the exercise harder to get progressive overload is either by adding repetitions or one, this is another one that I like to do. I slow down the tempo and I really focus on squeezing the muscle harder and holding that peak contraction. So for prime example, if you're doing a side lateral raise, instead of just like, you know, quickly going through the motions, slow down the tempo, hold and squeeze at the top, hold the top for a second, squeeze and really feel the shoulders activate. Same when you're doing a bicep curl. Like, don't just kind of randomly go through the motions as fast as you can. Slow it down. Squeeze, contract. Hold that peak contraction for a second at the top of each rep. And you can make light weights feel a lot heavier. And you'll actually get more muscle activation from it. So in those situations, even though the weights aren't going up, you're getting more muscle stimulation, more muscle activation, and more muscle growth. So, like... You, you could take two people curling a 20-pound dumbbell, right? Like a beginner who's just taking it and heaving and swinging it all over the place. Or you could take an advanced bodybuilder who's squeezing, contracting, getting a good mind-muscle connection. Even though both are lifting the 20-pound dumbbell, the advanced bodybuilder is getting more muscle activation and more growth from it. So don't get hung up on the weight. Focus on the quality over the quantity, right? That'll make the big difference. And that's probably why certain exercises, it feels like, I'm not getting stronger, but I seem to be getting more muscular. And that's probably why. All right. What else we got there? We have Chris joining in. Says, thanks for the advice. Uh, 
<laughs> my groin and hips are going to hurt after some back-to-back -back days of running. I'll add the exercise into my routine. Thanks. You're welcome. And like I say, when you do have those soreness, right, like anytime you're feeling extra sore, give yourself permission to do some active recovery. And I'm going to tell you, one of the fastest way to get rid of muscle soreness is through easy exercise, like walking and just easy mobility work and some light stretching and, you know, things like that. It's better than just sitting on your ass and doing nothing. So like if my legs are sore, right, like maybe I went and did a hard bike ride or hard leg workout or something like that and my legs are sore, I'm not just going to sit on the sofa the next day and do nothing. I'm going to get out and go for a walk. Because I still want to get them moving. I want to get the muscles, the joints, and the tendons and everything moving. I want to get some blood flow and circulation in there. And just that light, gentle exercise, that active recovery, helps to speed up the process much more than uh, simply doing nothing. So anytime you're feeling sore, you know, that's you you want to keep yourself active, but just low intensity activity. All right, another question here from JKS it says, Lee, I've heard that rice is one of the best sources of carbs because the body can break it down and use it more efficiently. Is this true? I won't say it's the best, but I mean, you're right. I mean, rice, for the most part, unless you have some allergic reaction to rice or some digestive issues, it's an easily absorbable source of carbohydrates. I mean, it's good complex carbohydrates for most people. You can digest it and utilize it easily. I like rice. I mean, I, I have it on a regular basis. So, I mean, it's one of my favorite complex carb sources, but I will have other sources as well. I'll have potatoes. Uh, I'll have oatmeal. I'll have pasta. I mean, there's, there's whatever. I have different sources of carbohydrates. I also like, you know, whole wheat wraps. Like that's another one of my favorites. I like sometimes put like meat and vegetables together and make it into a wrap. But like bottom line, have a well-balanced diet. Just don't focus on one sole food. But rice is certainly one of those complex carbohydrates that you can include into your into your program for sure. And as far as the brown versus white, I know this is a bit I should touch on this one as well. There's not a whole lot of difference like from a nutritional point of view and from a calories in calories out point of view. They're almost on par. Like there's a little bit more fiber content in the brown rice, but not it's it, it's not going to make or break your process, your program like if you had like two people dieting and one person was eating a cup of white rice and another one was eating a cup of brown rice and that was the only difference in their programs, like it's such a small difference you wouldn't even be able to tell. Like they would have the same calorie intake, the same fat loss, the same muscle growth. Like it's it's not enough to tell. Now, if that was like your only food source, rice, right? Like maybe like you see in some of these, you know, Asian cultures where people kind of like that's the staple. They live off rice. Uh, then, yeah, if you want to try and maximize the nutritional value you get from it, then the brown rice would probably be best because it's more nutritional value, more fiber and stuff like that. But if you're eating a mixed diet and you're getting a wide variety of foods, whether or not you eat white or brown, is not going to make a difference. It really is not. And personally, I eat white rice because I enjoy it. I, I usually get the basami rice or the jasmine rice or something like that. Sometimes I get the wild rice as well. That's that's a little different. The nutritional value and the caloric content of wild rice is a bit different than your typical white and brown. Uh, but still, I like eat the one that you enjoy, right? And as long as it's not your main food source, it's not really going to make a difference because you know, you're going to get it, your, your nutritional value covered uh, through a wide variety of foods, not just the rice. Uh, YT is asking my thoughts on push-ups and pull-ups every day, or do they need rest days? You can do them pretty much every day, but listen to your body. So like when you feel you need a rest day from them, take a rest day. And, and I, I want to address this because you can make good progress in the short term doing them every day. And the internet is full of these push-up challenges like you go on Facebook any fitness group out there or on Instagram or whatever and you're bound to find somebody who's doing a push-up challenge and posting a video of themselves doing their push-ups their daily push-ups for their push-up challenge right oh do 100 push-ups a day for the next 30 days or, or whatever the, the challenge is and in theory it makes sense and I understand it and respect it but this is what often happens when people are doing push-up challenges like that 
for the first two or three weeks, everything's going great. They're making progress. They're seeing results and everything else. And then after two or three weeks, oh, my shoulders are starting to bother me. Oh, there's a lot of tightness and tension there. Oh, my elbows are killing me. Oh, geez, it's hurting. And then they, they're they so ego-driven. It's like, man, I, I can't give up on the challenge, right? I've posted two weeks of me doing push-ups every day. Well, gosh darn it, I got to finish this challenge, right? I don't want to be the one not doing it. So then they complete the push-up challenge and they force themselves to do 30 days of push-ups or whatever. And then by the end of it, they end up straining their rotator cuff or their elbows are shot or something like that because of the repetitive movement strain. So you got to learn to listen to your body. When you're going through any of these exercises, if something hurts or doesn't feel right, like don't do it, <laughs> right? And, and don't get caught up in, in the ego of thinking that you've got to do something because you signed up for a challenge or or I got to do it every day, right? Like, no, you don't have to do it every day. Like, you can change it up, right? So that that's what I would caution you on. I mean, you can do them frequently, but if you get to the point where the shoulders are hurting, the elbows are hurting, the, the tendons in your pecs are hurting, like something just doesn't feel right, then don't force yourself through the pain let like give yourself a day or two of rest to let that rest recover and grow and then go back to it again. I mean, if you want, you could even do like an every other day challenge or something like that. That would be better than an every day. Cause at least then you're giving yourself a full 48 hours to rest, recover and grow between sessions. But that's the only caution I have when people try to do something every day is that it can lead to repetitive movement strain over time. And it usually doesn't show up until at least three weeks in. But then after that three-week mark, that's when that repetitive movement strain you can usually kick in. And, and that, that's why, in my case, I'll vary it up. Like, I say I exercise every day, but I'm not doing the same exercises, right? One day it's going to the gym. One day it's going for a bike ride. One day it's going for a walk. One day it's doing yoga. Like, that's it's I'm exercising, but I'm doing different movement patterns and working my body in different ways. So I'm still giving the movement patterns rest time, right? I'm, I'm not just you know, banging, banging up the joints, tendons, and ligaments with the same repetitive motion day after day after day. All right. Uh, Williams following up to the question I mentioned there earlier says, thank you so much. I'm going to look up Toastmasters. Hope they are also active in Germany. Uh, I'm pretty sure they are. Like say, this is an international group. I can't, I, I, I can't vouch for it for a hundred percent, but I know they're in pretty much every major city. So search for, Toastmasters.org, search for it in Germany, and you should be able to find them. I, I would be very surprised if there's not, right? Because they're a, an international group. And in fact, just to give you another level of Toastmasters, they even have an international competition where like all the different countries, like, well, first of all, 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 at all the different clubs, you know, you can qualify doing speech contests and then the winners at the club level can then go on and compete at the regional level. And then the regional level can then go on and compete at the national level. And then of course, then you get the best in the countries, you know, the best at the national level can then go on and compete at the international level. And they actually have uh, like international speech contests where pulled from thousands, thousands and thousands of clubs from all over the world. Right. So, I mean, it's, it's a, you know, if you want to go down the rabbit hole, I mean, it, it, it can be a very, you know, competitive uh, activity, if you will. But you don't need to go that level to make improvements. I mean, hey, just just doing Toastmasters at the local club level, like what I did. I mean, you can make amazing progress and reap the benefit of what Toastmasters is all about. And it's just about becoming a better communicator and developing that self-confidence. And for those of you, especially for the young people who are watching this, this is the superpower of the future. Communication. It really is. Because like most people these days are afraid to talk. Like when I, when I was growing up, we never had cell phones, right? You actually had to talk to people, <laughs> right? We, we didn't have online dating. You actually had to go ask a girl out. Like you had to physically communicate with people. And, and nowadays, like you don't have to do that anymore, right? I'll text you, I'll message you, all this, all that. Like people don't speak anymore and you see it. And I'm telling you, like the future superpower, it's not going to be like who's the greatest technology wizard or whatever. It's people who have the best communication skills. Those are the ones who are going to climb the corporate ladder and, and work their way up the, the ranks because those who can communicate are going to have an edge over those who can't. 
I mean, you could have someone who has all the technical knowledge and the skills, but if they can't communicate that knowledge and skills, they're going to be at a big disadvantage to someone who may be, you know, subpar in the tech area or the actual skills. But if they have better communication, then they're, they're just going to reach so much more people. So this is the superpower. And I'm telling you, like, don't neglect this, right? If, if this is a weak area for you, focus on it. And the best way that I can tell you to focus on it is through Toastmasters. I'm not paid. The Toastmasters is a nonprofit organization, but I'm just, I'm vouching for it because it's been a game changer for me, right? So some people say, oh, he's sponsored by Toastmasters. No, I'm not. I, I didn't get paid a dime. I, I paid to go there. <laughs> and it's not much, by the way. It, it's very small. Like, what was our club fees? Uh, it's probably gone up a bit now because everything's gone up. But I think it was like, it was less than $100 a year to join Toastmasters. It was crazy. Like, it was so inexpensive for what it was. I think it was like 40 or $50 every six months, something along those lines. And then, of course, you had to buy some books and manuals, which nowadays you don't even need to buy the books and manuals because it's all digital and online. So it's probably even cheaper than that. But bottom line, I mean, for the value you get from it, like it's it, it's it's a it's a no brainer. Anyway, moving on, we got RC joining in it says, hello, everybody. It's 1 a.m. here in the Mediterranean and quite warm. Quite warm here, too. I'm soaked with sweat. Like, I'm up in my office, and the heat rises. And I, I even put on a dry T-shirt for this chat, and i am got it sweat through already. <laughs> so I can appreciate the heat. You know? uh, we don't have AC. Like, that's one of the things. Like, it's it's in this area where I live, like, nobody has air conditioning. Well, I won't say nobody, but it's very rare. And because we only have, like, one or two months of the year where it would make sense. But... I would actually like it if I had air conditioning right now. Uh, but anyway, he's saying it's quite warm, over 100 degrees. Ain't that hot here. Uh, working out can be tough. So during my workouts now, while listening to Lee, best coach out there. So you're doing your workouts late in the evening. And you know what? There, I, can, I can appreciate that. For those of you who are living in a really hot area, and maybe you're training at a gym that doesn't have the best air conditioning, then... If you can manipulate your workout times to when it's less hot, that would be advantage and a huge advantage. Ideally, would be early in the morning, right? Like that's probably the coolest that it's going to be because at the end of the day, you know, buildings heat up from you know the sun beating down on the roof all day. So even after the sun sets, sometimes they can retain the heat long afterwards. So I mean, even into the evenings, you know, a lot of gyms and buildings and stuff like that can be pretty warm unless they're cooled with air conditioning. So if, if you're in that situation, and I was actually having a conversation with one of my coaching students today, um, you know, that's that's one of the things you need to work on, right? You need to try and manipulate your workouts to the times when it's most comfortable for you. Now, with that being said, I mean, you can still work out if it's hot, but just pace yourself, make sure that you're hydrated and all that good stuff. And, and don't overexert, like take extra long rest periods, make sure that you're adequately hydrated. And another kicker, have more sodium. This is something a lot of people neglect, but sodium is so important because what a lot of people do is when they sweat, they drink more fluid, but they're not replacing the sodium. And sweat is not just pure water. Sweat is sodium and electrolytes, primarily sodium. That's why sweat has that salty, sticky <laughs> texture to it, right? So, when you're sweating out, you're sweating out a lot of sodium. You're sweating out salt. So you need to purposely replenish that, either by adding salt to your food. Um, in my case, like when I go for, for long bike rides, I actually add salt to my water bottles, like just a few shakes of, of salt. I mean, it makes a difference because it helps to replenish, you know, so I'm hydrating and I'm also uh, putting back the electrolytes that I'm sweating out as well. So water and sodium, that's what you want to focus on when it's really hot and you're sweating more. All right, moving on, we have Solid Gido. G Gido it says, as a beginner, should I do one, two, or three types of compound exercises a week? My current workout routine is Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday. All right, one, two, or three types of compound exercises. What I would recommend, you know, just to, to keep this simple, over on my main Total Fitness Bodybuilding YouTube channel, I have some sample beginner programs. Like, and you can literally follow them 
set for set. Like, like it's, it's a good template to follow. Uh, and if, if you want, like even just go to YouTube's in the search bar, type in like Lee Hayward beginner workout, and you'll see some sample programs that you can follow. That's what I would recommend. Just just pick one of those programs. And, and quite honestly, it really doesn't matter which one you pick, because as a beginner, the most important thing is consistency. Is just get your ass to the gym and show up. Like what you actually do when you're there is secondary in importance to just showing up because anything you do consistently is going to produce results initially, right? As provided you're getting adequate rest and nutrition and all that stuff. So consistency is the most important thing. Once you're consistent and you got the habit in place and everything else and you got a routine and all that, then we can always focus on making it better. You know, we can optimize the exercises, you know, tweak certain movements to, based on your individual body type and mobility, you know, prioritize weak muscle groups and all that stuff. But that's, that's detail work that we focus on later. Like for now, just get your ass in the gym and get your ass in the gym on a consistent basis. Uh, another thing that I would recommend as well, you said your current routine is Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday. That's three consecutive days in a row. Like there's not much rest time between those days. In fact, there's no rest time between those days. Like you're working out three days in a row. Now you can still make it work if that's, like all you have available for whatever reason, let's just say you got some crazy schedule and the only time you can get to the gym is Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday, then make the best of it and, and do it. But ideally, I would recommend three non-consecutive days. So Monday, Wednesday, Friday, Tuesday, Thursday, Saturday, something along those lines, like have a day of rest in between each workout. So you work out one day, take the next day off, work out one day, take the next day off. That would be much better because you're giving your muscles a chance to rest, recover, and grow between training sessions. Whereas if you do, you go work out Monday, and then you work out again on Tuesday. Like, you're, you're not fully recovered from Monday's workout, and you're already in there breaking it down again on Tuesday. And then on Wednesday, you're not fully recovered from the previous two workouts, and then you're in there breaking it down again. Like, it's almost like you're digging yourself into a rut. Now, with that being said, after Wednesday, then you got four full days of recovery before you do it all over again. So you can still make it work. Don't get me wrong. But the better way to optimize that is to have three non-consecutive days per week. So if it's at all possible with your schedule, put a day of rest in between each of those workouts. And I think you'll make much better progress because of it. Uh, Pacey is saying, do you remember filming Cooking with Lee? Will there be a return? I used to do a lot more cooking and recipe type videos back in the day. Honestly, I haven't been doing a lot of the cooking in the house lately. My wife does the majority of it. <laughs> um, but, you know, maybe I'll do a cooking with, with Trish instead. <laughs> I don't know. But that's that that's something I could certainly do. I mean, it's the reason why I don't do a lot of it, I'll be honest, is because a lot of my meals, I mean, un unless it's a special family dinner that the wife prepares, but a lot of my staples are the same stuff over and over again. Like, I, I'm a type of person, like, I, I don't need a lot of eating variety to be happy and satisfied. So, like, my breakfast each morning is usually, like, high-protein oatmeal. I've already got a few videos showing high-protein oatmeal, so I don't need to make a new video every day showing the same recipe. Like, a lot of my lunches are usually, like, large garden salads with chopped up chicken breasts. You know, like, that's usually a staple for lunch. Uh dinner is you know usually some sort of meat and potatoes and vegetable type thing and i've got a lot of video showing you know basic meat and potato and vegetable type things so there, there, a lot of them are repetitive right like i mean yes i'll change it up from time to time and have different foods but i'm kind of like a creature of habit and i find like just having that stability and that's part of the reason why i haven't been making a whole lot of cooking videos is because like it's the same stuff that i've already made videos on in the past so like I don't know. I mean, I could, right? I, I'm I'm sure if I made the same videos all over again, people would still enjoy them. But it's just, I, I feel a bit like this is redundant. <laughs> like I have already done this. Why do I need to make it again? But if there's a big demand for it, sure, I'll show I'll show my redundant meals on YouTube. <laughs> Uh, we have another question from Steve saying, what are your views on creatine? I personally take pure creatine monohydrate. I take about five grams per day on a consistent basis. And there's a lot of health benefits to creatine. It's not just a fitness supplement, but it's an overall health supplement. All right. So, I mean, it's you, you obviously it will improve your, your strength and, and energy, especially when it comes to strength training. But it also helps with mental and cognitive functions as well. 
And there's been studies showing like creatine can also help with mental degenerative diseases, like people with Alzheimer's and Parkinson's and things like that have benefited from supplementing with creatine. So creatine is like a good all around health supplement, not just bodybuilders and athletes, but like even your grandparents should be supplementing with creatine, you know, for the mental and, and health benefits from it. So I use creatine five grams a day on a daily basis, and it's a staple in my routine. I just, like, I take my vitamins every day. I take my creatine every day. Simple as that. Uh, what else we got there? YT is asking if I believe in bulking and cutting, not dirty bulking, but lean bulking to build muscle, or are you aiming more for eating at maintenance? I'm... <sighs> there's exceptions to everything. All right. Like there, there's depending on the individual and the situation and the goals, there is a time and a place for bulking and cutting and all that. But for the majority of people focusing on maintenance is where it's at sustainability. That's where it's at. Because when you're purposely trying to gain or purposely trying to lose, it's not really sustainable long-term like it's okay for a short-term thing like you know a bodybuilder getting ready for a contest okay yeah you got to cut you know someone who's like a, a strong man or a power lifter or someone who's trying to maximize their size and strength okay well you got to purposely put yourself into a calorie surplus which is a, a bulk right but for the average person maintenance and body recomposition is where it's at and that's like all the people that i've coached within the muscle after 40 blueprint, like most of them are in that phase like it's it's probably maintenance with emphasis on one area or another like sometimes if someone's uh, like they've already achieved their fat loss goals and now they want to slowly start to fill up their frame with muscle then we'll probably be like a couple hundred calories over maintenance you know but if most people they're probably like a few hundred calories below maintenance so that they can tap into burning stored body fat while still achieving that body recomposition but that's where I usually recommend is keeping things close to maintenance because that's where things are comfortable. That's where things are sustainable. It doesn't feel like you're, you're suffering it out either on a high calorie or low calorie diet. When your diet is as close to maintenance as possible, it's enjoyable, right? And you can sustain that long term. Whereas like if you go extremely low calories, even though, yeah, it works for dropping weight quickly. It's not enjoyable and it's not sustainable. And eventually you'll get to the point where you're like, I'm fed up with cutting. And then you people usually go off the deep end. And then, you know, that's when the rebound, you know, they start binge eating, rebound and yo-yo weight gain, all that stuff happens. And so I'm, I'm not a fan of the extremes, you know, the, the all or nothing extremes. And I, I used to do that. Like that was me back in my bodybuilding days, right? Like when I get ready for a competition, it was 12 weeks of boiled chicken and broccoli, two hours of cardio, six days a week in the gym, burn the candle at both ends and just suffer it out. And, and like, that's the mindset that a lot of bodybuilders and physique models have is like, Hey, I'm just going to suffer it out and deprive myself and get as shredded as possible. And yeah, it works in the short term, but then like, as soon as the contest is over, right, as soon as the, the placings are announced and the pictures are taken and the dust is settled, and it's like, okay, where, where's the all-you-can-eat buffet? Where's the pizza place? Where's the ice cream shop? Like, where's all the shit that I was craving in the months leading up to this contest? And then you go and binge eat on all the stuff that you were depriving yourself of. And it took you months of hardcore cutting to lose it. Only a few weeks of binge eating to put it all back. And now you're fatter than ever, back to square one. And then trying to justify it by telling everybody that, you know, I'm bulking up because it's the off season, right? Trying to get bigger for next year's competition, which is all a crock of bullshit. It's just you couldn't control yourself because you were so deprived. And then you started binge eating and you got fat. And that was me. I, I did that for 17 years as a competitive bodybuilder, right? Up and down, up and down. And now I, I don't do that anymore, right? Like bulk and cut is not part of my, you know, my, my nutrition protocol whatsoever. It's all about staying as close to maintenance as possible and eating based on what I'm doing. So like if I have a very high activity day, then I will eat more to match my activity level. If I have a low activity day, I'll eat less to match my activity level. And I try to keep my calories at maintenance. And, you know, that's why my body weight has pretty much stayed stable over the last few years. And it's, it's much more enjoyable. It's much more healthy. And that's what you know, achieving a, a, a health and fitness transformation is all about. It's about like getting to your ideal weight and then finding how, how you can sustain it and enjoy the process. Because 
I would argue that maintaining is harder than losing because I've known a lot of people who can suffer it out and lose weight in the short term. Very few who can maintain it as a lifestyle. Like, I mean, prime example, I know countless people who competed in bodybuilding before, you know, dieted down, got ripped, shredded, six pack abs, look good on stage, look good in photos and all that. And then you see him six months or a year later and like, what the hell happened to you? Right. You look like the Pillsbury Doughboy, you know, ballooned up. Right. Yeah. They suffered it out and they could like put the blinders on and dedicate themselves to like a few months of extreme torture and willpower. But they didn't have a system to sustain it long term and knowing how to sustain it long term. That's that's where you really need to be. Right. I mean, that's that's what I focus on teaching my coaching students in the Muscle After 40 Blueprint is that sustainable lifestyle approach and not this all or nothing extreme cutting approach. Because, yeah, sure, it works in the short term. But like I say, if, if you can't do it as a lifestyle and it doesn't last long term, then ultimately, what's the point? Right. Well, what's the point of dropping 30 pounds through some crazy hardcore cutting diet only to put 40 pounds back on because you binged eat and you couldn't sustain it? Right. I mean, you'd be better off doing nothing <laughs> versus lose 30 and put on 40. And, and that's the reality for most people who go on a diet. Like they they ultimately get fatter with every diet they do, because that's what happens. Like you go, you starve yourself and you drop 20 pounds and then you binge eat, you put 30 back on and then you get fed up and you starve yourself again. You drop another 20 or 30 pounds and then you end up putting 40 back on. And it's always like it's it's two steps forward, three steps back, right? It's always like, you know, you're never moving forward doing that. So you need to change the whole approach and look at how do I do this, sustain it and enjoy the process as a lifestyle. And once you master that, it's like a burden lifted off your shoulders. Like to be able to be in shape, enjoy the process, be happy with your physique and not feel like you're on a diet, not that you're suffering it out. Like, man, it's just like the game changer. Right. And that's something I've never, ever experienced back when I was bodybuilding. But it's something that I'm experiencing now because I finally figured this shit out after 30 years of trial and error. <laughs> All right. What else we got there? Um, speaking of bulking and cutting, we have someone who's bulking. <laughs> uh, we got uh, Ann just saying, I'm bulking up but struggling to get all the food in my stomach because I have a hard time eating, thinking of swapping potatoes for higher calorie granola. Is that okay? Much less volume, more calories. It, it is okay in certain situations, but like I, I want you to really pay attention to how your body is responding. Like, don't force feed yourself. Like, eating until you're comfortably full is, is should be enough. And you don't need to be in some massive calorie surplus. Like, a little above maintenance is all you need. Like if, if you're bulking, like shoot for maintenance calories and then maybe like one to 200 calories above maintenance. Like that's it. It shouldn't be struggling and feeling like you're force feeding yourself and you can't consume all the food you need. Like that, that, that whole force feeding yourself is, I mean, yeah, it works in the short term, but ultimately, unless, you know, you're got some extreme crazy fast metabolism it ultimately usually leads to more fat gain than muscle gain like your body is very intelligent like it will tell you when it's had enough right like you don't don't try and force your body to do something that it doesn't want to do right like forcing it to eat when it doesn't want to eat like listen to your body and, and eat until you're comfortably full now again with that being said if if you are super lean and, and like you're still, you know, you really want to fill out your frame with more muscular body weight, then yeah, if you want to swap in some higher calorie foods or maybe look for ways to bump up the calories on the foods you're eating. Like for example, if, if you want to bump up the calories on your potatoes, well maybe add some butter to your potatoes or maybe a little bit of sour cream to your potatoes or something like that. Maybe a little bit of cheese to your potatoes. Like that that's a way to bump up the calorie intake without adding a lot of volume. Right? I mean, there's, there is a time and a place for doing s strategies like that, but you know, it's, you got to look at the individual and, and the individual circumstances, right? Like most people are not in the situation where they're trying to gain weight, right? Like, as I mentioned earlier, you go out in public and look at the average person. Most people are trying to lose weight, right? But there are some exceptions to that rule, right? We do have some 
you know, guys who are extremely skinny and, and rapid, fast metabolisms, and they def- desperately want to fill out their frame and put some meat on their bones. So in those situations, some of these old school bulking strategies do have some merit. All right, moving along. I'm going to get ready and clue it up because I've been, I've been rambling on for over an hour here now. I usually try to keep these to an hour, but those of you who are regulars know I rarely do. <laughs> I usually go over and above. Um, what else we got there? Uh, Seth is saying, I'm getting ready for my first bodybuilding show in October. I started shaving for a week now, but my upper legs are getting razor burn. Any tips or will they get used to it? Um, use a, uh, you can get clippers. Like, I, I don't know what kind of razor you're using, but if, if you've never shaved your legs before, don't use a razor blade. It's going to be torture. You're going to have razor rash all over the place, and it's going to be uncomfortable and ingrown hairs and all that kind of shit. I get, um, like, you can go and buy these manscaping type of electric razors. Like, even uh, when I'm, like, if I haven't shaved body hair in a while, like when I did my last bodybuilding show, which was over a year ago now, because but when I shaved, I, I just took the hair cutting clippers that I use for cutting my hair, you know, the, the buzz clippers. I just used that. I took the... Um, the, the comb off and just use the, the clipper itself and just shave the, the hair. Now, granted, it's not close as a blade, you know, I mean, there's still like that little tiny layer of stubble, but it's close enough, right? I mean, like, and if, if you get an electric razor, uh, you know, especially one of some of these, you know, good, good uh, electric razors, like you can shave without irritating the skin too much. And that's what I would recommend. And even though it's not like super, super close, it's close enough that you're not going to see the hair, uh, you know, when you're competing on stage. So that's what I would recommend, um, you know, to help avoid the razor rash. And that's what, I mean, I used to do that for years. It's just use an electric razor. I mean, sometimes I would use the, uh, the razor blade, you know, if in, in certain areas or whatever, but it, it's really not necessary. Like th- the judges are not that close to you that they're going to see like a fraction of a millimeter of stubble, right? Like it's, it's not, they're not that close and they're not rubbing your legs or anything like that. They're not going to feel the stubble. So like, as long as there's no visible hair, right, you've got it trimmed down, you're, you're good enough, right? So I, I would recommend the electric razor. That's what I would do. And if you are going to use a razor blade, use a, a fresh blade every time and make sure you, you got some good shaving cream and stuff like that to prevent it. But th- there's really no need of this. Like from a bodybuilding competition point of view, electric razor is the way to go. It's quicker, it's easier, and there's less irritation. Okay. Men talking about shaving their legs. What does the world come to? <laughs> All right. Um, I'm going to, sc- all right, let's just see what else we got there. Uh, I'm going to get ready to clue this up. So I'm just, just do, 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 do. Uh, Nicholas is joining in. Hey, Nicholas. Nicholas is part of the uh, Muscle After 40 coaching program. It says eating till 80% full. That's all I remember these days. <laughs> yeah, that's a good habit to get into, especially if your goal is to lose body fat is Basically, the the rule or the habit a lot of people refer to is eat till 80% full. But there's no gauge in your stomach to say like, hey, where's 80%, right? Oh, here, I'm at 75. Oh, I'm at 80. Oh, I went to 85 too much. No, like it's not like you've got a, a gauge in your belly. It's, it's a philosophy. So 80% full just means stop before you're stuffed. And get used to purposely eating slightly smaller portions than you normally do. And what'll happen is... When you leave the table just slightly less than full, right? Like you stop before you're stuffed. Very often what happens is within 20 minutes after the meal, you actually feel very comfortably full because it takes about 20 minutes for your brain and your belly to link up that you've eaten, right? So like you could start slamming back a lot of food, especially if you're a fast eater and you could overfill yourself within 20 minutes. And then afterwards you're like, oh my God, I ate too much. I just want to go lie down on the couch and you know, vegetate. 
And think of like Thanksgiving dinner or, or all you can eat buffets. And then this kind of situation where you, you eat until you're ready to burst. Like you don't want to do that, especially if your goal is fat loss or even if your goal is muscle building, like that's not healthy either. Like eating beyond your, your, your comfort capacity is not helping. I mean, it's just literally bogging down your digestive system with excess calories and this makes it harder to digest. So you're better off stopping slightly before fullness. So like you're, you, when you're at, finishing up your meals, like, you know what, I could go back for another helping, but you know, I'm good. I, I'm satisfied. I'm going to stop and then get used to that feeling of just being satisfied and stopping before you're full. And then what you'll find is after the meal is over, then you feel comfortably full. You don't feel that heavy sluggish bloated feeling and it's actually easier on your digestive system. And of course that's a, a simple way to cut your calories without actually changing your, your eating habits. You're just literally cutting your portions ever so slightly. Even if you, even if you ate the exact same foods, whether processed junk food or whatever, if you just ate slightly smaller portions, you just created a calorie deficit over what you were doing before. So, I mean, that's, that's a very powerful habit and strategy for uh, managing your caloric intake. And it's also easier on your digestive system as well. Uh, what else we got there? Um, uh, we have server Lux saying my workout program is Monday push, Tuesday pull, Thursday legs and abs, and Friday and, and F N L Y Friday. I'm not sure what that means. And increase reps. I made this program myself and I've seen good progress. Well, if you're seeing good progress, that's all that matters, right? If it's working, right? If, if it ain't broke, don't fix it, right? Anytime you, you follow a program, whether it's one that you got or you made or whatever, it doesn't matter. If you're seeing progress, like ride that wave of momentum and see it through, like reap, reap the progress. And then when the progress slows down and eventually plateaus, then you can change it up. But like for now, if you're seeing results, keep going. Uh, what else we got there? Uh, got a question there. I finally started gaining weight, taking vitamin D3 every now and then because I was low on D3, taking omega-3s, a B-complex, and I started drinking whey protein powder. I would recommend doing that on a daily basis, like not every now and then, like when it comes to your supplements, consistency. So like I personally take vitamin D3 every morning. Uh, I take B complex. I take my fish oils, my high potency of fish oils for omega threes. Like I take that stuff on a daily basis because you want to build that the consistency, you know, to keep those nutrients in your system, and then have your have a reserve on hand, not just like every now and then. I mean, even though every now and then is better than never, but consistency is is the most important thing. You know, get into the habit of being consistent with them, and you'll see better results. And the final question we have here is from Mix Doe asking for my thoughts on testosterone replacement therapy. And I have a video up on YouTube, very detailed video going into my thoughts on testosterone replacement therapy. So if you do a search for Lee Hayward, TRT, or Lee Hayward, HRT, um, TRT is testosterone replacement therapy, and HRT is hormone replacement therapy. If you do a search for that, then you should see that video. And if not, just scroll through my recent uploads and you should be able to find it there on my channel. But that's a very detailed video where I go into sharing my thoughts on it. And I actually share some real world results from one of my personal coaching students who's utilized testosterone replacement therapy and has really made some solid progress as a result of utilizing that. So if you want to go check out that video. And with that being said, I'm going to get ready and clue it up. So I've been going for an hour and 18 minutes, and I only meant to go for an hour. So I over-delivered by 18% today. <laughs> Hopefully you enjoyed the video chat. As always, I enjoy doing these chats, and I'll have the replay along with the timestamps posted up over the weekend. And if, in the meantime, if you do have any questions or you need any help beyond what we've covered here today, feel free to reach out to me personally. I mean, you can reach me through email, leeh at leehayward.com. Or you can friend me up over on Facebook. It's facebook.com forward slash Lee dot Hayward on Facebook. 
feel free to reach me on either one of those and we can have a chat. And if we need to, then we can even, uh, you know, book in for a strategy call. I do offer those as well, especially for those of you who are interested in getting some more advanced help with uh, customized training and nutrition programs. We can certainly jump on a Zoom call and have a chat and discuss a realistic action plan to help you reach your fitness and fat loss goals. So if that's something you're interested in, feel free to reach out to me. And in the meantime, have yourself a fantastic weekend, and I will talk to you next week, same time, same place. We'll be going live at 5 next Friday. Take care. Over and out.